I'm Danny Dyer, and this is the Real Football Factories. I played Tommy Johnson in the movie The Football Factories, which was all about football violence. But that was just acting. Now I'm on a journey around the country meeting the real firms who have mass offs at football matches for real. No fake blood, no stuntmen, no makeup. This time it's just me and the country's hardest hooligans. I meet the real top boys who tell you the score. This week on The Real Football Factories, I've come to a place that's both beautiful and brutal. This is a country whose football fans are generally believed to be peace-loving whiskey drinkers who wear kilts. But I can tell you, the real story is very different. This is a country which is home to one of the world's most vicious, brutal and murderous rivalries. This is a land that's been a battleground for some of the most feared and fashionable football hooligans in Britain. Welcome to Scotland. There's nothing like having a proper row. There's just nothing can beat that. The adrenaline takes over and it's just like a red mist. You just see that mob and that's, that's where you're heading. They've used petrol bombs, they've used CS gas, they've used clubs. I travelled up to Scotland to find out the story north of the border in the world of football violence. I'm going to be in Glasgow, home of Celtic and Rangers, known as the Old Firm, arguably world football's bitterest rivals. I'll also be in Aberdeen, where I'll meet Scotland's first football casuals. And then there's Edinburgh, home to the weapon-wielding hooligans of Hibs, who turn their city into a fortress. Tartan Army, the merry bunch of hard drinking but bonny Scottish fans who follow their national team through thin and thinner are the friendly face of Scottish football. But there's nothing friendly between Scotland's two most supported and successful clubs Celtic and Rangers. They both hail from Glasgow, and this is where I'm starting my journey. It's Derby Day one of the most explosive fixtures on the planet. And I'm going to this game because I've heard it's more than just a football match. Glasgow is a city divided by religion. One side's Catholic and the other's Protestant. Celtic are the Catholic team and Rangers the Protestant one. It all dates back to the age-old sectarianism of Northern Ireland, which was brought to Scotland in the 19th century, when thousands of Irish immigrants, both Catholic and Protestant, settled in Glasgow. So what you get, in a sense, is the decanting into especially West Central Scotland, the age-old sectarian traditions of the north of Ireland. In the beginning, the two communities and the two football teams that represented them got on. The newspapers of the time pointed out that they had very considerable friendly relations. Rivalry was there, but the sectarian element only came in later. In the 1920s, a huge recession hit the city. During this time of hardship, the majority Protestant population turned on the Catholic minority, discriminating against them in all walks of life. And so Glasgow became a divided city. The troubles in Northern Ireland fanned the flames of Glasgow's problems from across the Irish Sea, and the sectarian hatred was distilled through the two football teams. Down the years, violence and the old firm have gone hand in hand. It wouldn't be the same at a Rangers Celtic match if opposing supporters didn't clash. One 18-year-old supporter was knocked to the ground and as he tried to rise, another fan struck at his head with a meat cleaver. And if the trouble wasn't happening on the terraces, players would be more than happy to oblige. And an angry exchange there between McAvenny and Woods of his son but it was the 1980 Scottish Cup final that saw the worst violence in the fixture's history. A late winner gave Celtic the trophy and hundreds of their fans invaded the pitch to celebrate. 
they were soon joined by hundreds of their Rangers counterparts, and Hamden Park became a battleground. This is possibly the worst incident I have seen in a football field in 25 years of world travel. Bottles of alcohol which fans were allowed to bring into the stadium became weapons as the drunken fans fought toe to toe, while the police struggled to regain order. Policemen foot trying to stop this horrific trouble. Whatever anyone tells you, the mood in general terms is one of, of hatred. People who, certainly for the duration of that match, um, support their team with uh, a passion. But it's a passion which has got a negative connotation to it. This is Jim McTaggart, ex-member of Rangers Mob, the Intercity firm. Jim is banned from Rangers for life and served time in a Dutch prison thanks to his overzealous commitment to the ICF calls. I've been to some other derbies dotted about and a Ranger Celtic match is by far the worst. John O'Kane is the son of Irish immigrants and bleeds green and white. He's also a member of the Celtic Soccer Casuals. He has a record of football offences longer than the proverbial arm and was jailed two years ago for this attack on a pub. It's probably the most intense rivalry uh, anywhere in Britain anyway, uh, by far. Every game, doesn't matter if it's a old Glasgow Cup match, there's still going to be trouble. There's riots, there's fights, referee getting attacked, people invading the park. There's people getting stabbed, killed, horses chasing people along fucking main roads and madness. And only because they're Celtic Rangers fans. They, they do hate each other. So what I wondered would happen at the game. I'd come up to Glasgow to the old firm Derby to get a taste of it for myself. I support a passionate club, West Ham. I understand what passion's about, but um, I mean, this is, this is powerful, man, I tell you, this is powerful. You can smell, you can smell the atmosphere, you get a taste of it, you can taste this tension. I just, um, you know, it's really hard to explain. These are two clubs that despise each other. They absolutely, I mean, it's political, it's deep. And it's like, they're so close, they're so close, it's unbelievable. I think it's important to differentiate between a normal match where your concern could be for pre-planned disorder between known hooligan groups and a Celtic Rangers match where your concern is more for spontaneous disorder. Just had a constant stream of the Celtic, right? They, 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 they've allocated the other side of the road. But they're surrounded by Rangers, all Rangers along here, look, and they're just giving it to them. Look, even the bird that works in the car park, look. Giving it to Bigger. You just sense that at any point, it's going to kick off. And I mean kick off, you know, and if it goes, you know it's going to go. But, you know, fingers crossed, it's going to be sweet. We're going to have a nice game today. I'm going to get a feel of what it's about, and I'm not going to get my head kicked in. To ensure that didn't happen, I've met up with Celtic soccer casual John O'Kane. This was the closest John could get to the game. He's banned from attending any football matches because of his football crimes. Just talk about a bit of the trouble you've seen at these games. Oh, the worst one ever was uh, it's the main game, the Celtic Rangers game, got cancelled at Celtic Park. So uh, 60,000 came here for the reserves. <laughs> there was a riot. And this is for a reserve game? A reserve game, yeah. Uh, the, next, the papers the next morning, headlines, 184 arrests, and that's all the reserves. Oh. It was mayhem. The police were totally unprepared. So you was involved in that tear up, John, was you? I was, uh, I was there, eh? <laughs> <laughs> I was one of the, I was one of the 184 of this. Yeah, was you? Aye. It's the hottest ticket around, and I'm lucky enough to have got one in the Celtic end. It's now time. Now that, I'll tell you what, mate, that, that now, I, I should put that away because someone's going to bash me over the nut. Oh, listen, I'm going into the lion's den, mate. I cannot wait. I can't wait to get in. I want to go in and have it, all right? I was one of the 48,000 lucky enough to be crammed into Ibrox. And in typical old firm fashion, the game was settled by a single goal. And it was Celtic who got it. The game might not have been a classic, but the atmosphere was incredible. I'll tell you what. Tell you what, man, it's like being pumped full of drugs, honestly. It was amazing, absolutely. I, 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 I'm blown away at them. I mean, my head's pounding. I mean, that was powerful. It was something that um, I've never experienced that before, ever. And, uh, and I'll tell you what, yeah, 
you only on this earth once, and I, would, and I would say to you now, you've got to experience an old firm derby, mate, I tell you. So having watched the game with the Celtic fans, the plan was to go and meet up with the Rangers. But I'll be honest with you, I was a little bit nervous about jumping across the divide so quickly. So now, I'm going to go and get Vine from the Rangers. Now, they've just lost. I don't know how this is going to play, to be honest with you. I ain't too happy about it, but I don't care. Let's get involved. I want to see. Hopefully, they're going to be all right with me. They're going to be sweet. I'm not, I don't know whether or not I'm going to tell them I was in the Celtic end. I'm going to have to make a decision on that when I get near the gaff. But um, I've been assured they're proper people. They're going to look after me. They've lost, but hopefully, they're going to take me under their wing. We'll see. I was heading into Bridgeton, a tough and staunchly Protestant part of Glasgow. Here, everyone is a Rangers fan. Crossing the divide on Derby Day is not something you do lightly, but I was going to meet Jim McTaggart and the Rangers boys in one of the most hardcore Rangers boozers. I wasn't sure how they'd react to me. Less than an hour ago, I was in the Celtic end at their ground. Now I was coming to their manor and I hold me hands up. I've heard of better ideas. Fortunately, they recognised me from my film work. I was given a warm welcome, a pint of the local brew, and I was soon back to my usual self. Listen, thanks for talking to me, Jim. I appreciate it, mate. Um, no I've been wrapped around the Celtic today, yeah? And I want to get both sides of the argument, yeah? yeah. You know, so it's just been a mad experience for me. I'm a West Ham fan, but um, you know, this this is this is like on a large scale. This lot, you know what I'm saying? It's mainly religion. That's why the. If you take that away, obviously, if you take that away, it's Rangers Celtics. It's just yeah, yeah, old no, derby, exactly, yeah, exactly. You know? It's just another old derby, yeah. isn't it? So, I mean, how does it work? I mean, you know, running with a firm and all that. And what is it? What's the buzz of it? I mean, why do you do it? The feeling you get, it's just adrenaline, really. It's just being with your mates, and you're up against other people, like-minded people. They're there for a. Yeah. A dash, and that's that. So what do you reckon is going to happen later? Do you think it's going to, you know, because at the uh, moment it seems quite calm, you know what I mean? You're all segregated. It's quiet down but... here because obviously this is the Rangers area and it's, yeah. they've been beating their biggest rivals, you know, be quiet, but they'll probably they'll be guaranteed there'll be trouble later. Yeah, they will be. Guaranteed yeah. everywhere, everywhere. As far as trouble was concerned before, during and straight after the match, the police, as usual, had it under control. But with the game finished at 2.30 in the afternoon, there was a long day ahead. The fans will dissipate and they'll, they'll head towards uh, city centres and town centres in smaller areas uh, across West Central Scotland and further afield and keep them apart in pubs, clubs and whatever um, thereafter becomes more difficult. On the day we filmed in Glasgow, there were 16 cases of serious assault and one attempted murder. And that's quite by old firm standards. In years gone by, when Celtic and Rangers fans left their own private war in Glasgow behind and followed their teams away, the invasion of other smaller cities in Scotland really got the goat of opposition fans. There was thousands of them. I mean, they, they used to come uh, into a, a ground holding 25,000. They'd maybe bring 20,000. You know, we'd 5,000 in the stadium. And when you think that 20,000 people were coming in early in the morning, they're usually boozed up. So they're taking over the pubs, they're taking over the carry out shops, they're taking over the parks. From early in the morning to late at night, Celtic Rangers would just dominate your town. For almost a century, Celtic and Rangers ruled the roost both on and off the pitch. But Scottish football and the violence that came with it was about to be transformed. I headed north out of Glasgow and 130 miles up the east coast of Scotland to the city that dared to stand up to the old firm. In the 1980s, Aberdeen, more famous for farming than football, broke the old firm's dominance. They became kings of Scottish football, guided by the now legendary Sir Alex Ferguson. Fergie came up to us from St Mirren and took the bull by the horns and, and continued it to the greatest heights that we could have ever imagined. Aberdonians turned out in their thousands to welcome home Britain's team of the season. It's been a fortnight of heroics and hangovers in the Granite City. It was phenomenal. 
to actually be a dominant force and actually be confident of going and, and beating on a regular basis Rangers and Celtic away was, was just heaven. Aberdeen was Britain's boomtown. In the 1970s, when North Sea oil was discovered offshore, it became the centre of Britain's new oil industry and one of the wealthiest cities in Britain, no longer a Scottish outpost. Aberdeen was the place to be. And her vibrant, exciting and confident football team reflected the mood of the city. People were talking about Aberdeen on the park and, and uh, we wanted them to talk about Aberdeen off the park as well. And talk about them off it they would. As the team gained a reputation for great football, a section of their fans became famous for less glorious reasons. You may not think it to look at him today, but this man, Jay Allen, was one of the leading faces of Aberdeen's firm until he retired in 1986. As a teenager, he'd become fascinated by the violence he saw at football. As a young supporter, I, mean, I was intrigued and excited when there was trouble, but only got close enough to it until it really came on top, and then I would run away with the rest of the youngsters. I think I was sort of 17 the first time, actually, just I didn't run away and just steamed right in and realised that it was... Uh, it was great. Buoyed by the success of their team, Aberdeen had a growing army of young fans who wanted to stand out from the other football mobs of scarf wearers, skins and bobber boots. And the inspiration came when they travelled to Liverpool for a European Cup game and caught a glimpse of what the opposition fans were wearing. So looking across the fence, there was maybe 300 young men, no scarves, side shades, and uh, looked like new romantic disco boys, <laughs> and uh, which we just totally didn't understand. We never heard of this before. But um, I think a lot of us strangely thought, you know, that's pretty cool. The Aberdeen Soccer Casuals were born. Scotland's first casual hooligan firm. Here I am, sunny Aberdeen. Beautiful, it is absolutely beautiful. I think it's the furthest north I've ever been in my life, and it is absolutely taters. But I'm here to meet up with some of the original members of one of Britain's first casual firms. This is Bob Carmichael, Aberdeen born and bred, oil rig worker, and a member of the ASC for the past 20 years. So, you used to mob up how many of you? Bobby. You're talking about 400, 500, but um, at a home game, you could end up sitting in that south stand with a thousand. That's a good firm, isn't it? All right. Do you reckon it had anything to do with the, the team at the time, the success the team was? Oh, right, that, yeah. that was a major play in it. Like, I mean, uh, the clothes, the clothes started changing, and then it, that made a difference. The guys were standing out. There was no football colours on or anything like that. Folk were trying to put on tracksuits and yeah, uh, designer yeah. gear and yeah, yeah. golf wear, tennis wear and stuff like that. And then the oil industry was booming then. So people had money and the kids had money from the parents who were working offshore and that. So everybody had the gear. And, um, so that's why, so that's yeah. why everyone was could yeah. run about. And, right, yeah. and it wasn't snide none of the gear, was no, it? Obviously in the 80s, snide, so no. it was all proper gear. But the, the thing is, we were the only ones that were doing it. We were going, to, other teams were coming to this ground and they were still dressed as skinheads. They were still dressed as punks and people were like, you know, yeah. who's that crowd there, you know? Okay, so it's always nice to have a tear up with a nice bit of clobber on, you know what I mean? It was the 1980s and football violence in England and Aberdeen came wearing a designer label, but the rest of Scotland was lagging behind. At other clubs such as Motherwell, the hooligan element was still into the traditional skinhead bother boy look. Ex-Motherwell mob member Matt Johnson was one of them, and he didn't think the casuals looked up to much. You're all big tough skinheads, you know. We looked at these guys with big wedge haircuts and tight jeans, big white trainers, and we just said to ourselves, who are these poofs? We expected they would run, you know. The poofs were going to run. No, they fought back and they done well. So that was your first experience of the casuals. Not only could they fight, they could get away with it. Casual was a camouflage. You basically couldn't move in, mother, for police if you were a skinhead. They would stop you for no reason, search you for no reason. Now, that, that was about the time when everybody started saying to themselves, wait a minute, 
these guys are getting away with murder solely because of the way they dress. And so Motherwell decided to go casual too. They were the first after us to turn trendy and actually arrive in Aberdeen Station dressed. So, you know, that was quite exciting for us. We finally had another mob that were dressers and like-minded. Soon everyone was doing it. All the club firms decided to dress up for the ruck. You just couldn't believe how quickly things evolved and, and how many people actually jumped on the bandwagon kind of thing. And almost overnight, it became like an obsession. All the boys in Scotland wanted to get all the top designer gear, the best labels, the latest designs. So in order for them to look top dog north of the border, they had to go down south to London, where the streets ain't quite paved with gold, but the shops are filled with treasure. It was taken very seriously, and a lot, a lot of money was spent on clothes. For working class guys to shell out maybe about half their wages on a tracksuit top was, was unbelievable. Um, and it just went beyond all proportion. A lot of the boys used to write letters into the face, slagging off the other teams for not being up to speed with their fashion. Scotland was now a casual battleground, and the police were caught cold by the new design of violence. It did catch us unawares at, at the time. A quarter of a century ago, we did not have the sophistication in terms of intelligence, which we, we do now. I think now uh, we're better placed to combat these type of organised hooligan groups than we were in the 1980s. Oh, it took them years to get, to get in control of it. That's why the, the early days, the early years were so much fun, because they didn't have a clue what we were all about. The new breed of soccer hooligans, calling themselves the casuals, pose a threat to the game. The media had a story. The casuals had inherited the mantle of the mods and rockers of the 60s and the skinheads of the 70s. The Scottish newspapers went casual crazy. In 1985, Andy Colvin was a young journalist at the Sunday Post newspaper in Scotland. The newspaper wanted the casual exclusive, and so he was told he was going undercover. I travelled up to Aberdeen on the train, got in there, got their trust, and my cover story going up to Aberdeen with a Glaswegian accent was that I worked on the oil rigs and I was back home but I was up for a fight if there was a fight on the go. And the only stipulation they made was when the fight starts you cannot turn and run, otherwise we will turn on you. Nobody understood how well structured casuals were. Football hooligans up to then had been people running wild after a game, fueled by drink, and they didn't care who got caught in the middle or anything else. The casuals picked their targets carefully. It was other casuals. It was people they'd arranged to fight. It was all about dominating the town that they'd gone into. Andy tried to keep on the fringes of the mob and away from the front line action as much as he could. The whole kind of brief was don't break the law. You know, try, well, try not to break the law. Because the, the paper I worked for at the time, I think they would regard it as worse if I'd been jailed than if I'd been killed. So if I knew it was going to happen, then I let the police know. And we did manage to stop a fight that would have taken place in Motherwell, that was pre-arranged, and I think would have been very violent. And he spent nine months risking life and limb undercover as a football hooligan. His incredible story hit the papers, and his cover was blown. By the time I'd finished doing this, I had two drawers in my desk, one full of death threats, and one full of letters from casual groups asking me to go and join them. We created the monster. We gave these people publicity, and the more publicity they got, the more they wanted. In part three, I'm headed to Edinburgh, where the kids from the capital city decided to up the ante in the football violence stakes. I'd been in Scotland for four days, and I'd heard some incredible stories from Glasgow and Aberdeen. But what about Edinburgh? I'd heard that it was home to one of Scotland's toughest firms. 
Hibernian was the team, and their mob go under the name of the CCS, the Capital City Service. The Hibs crew started life when gangs from different parts of the city came together under the one banner. Ex-service member Derek Dykes is 39 years old and has over 30 convictions for football violence. He was there when it all kicked off. It was the gangs, like all the different gangs for our different areas. And I used to go along with the gang for Leaf when Celtic and Rangers and that used to come. And they used to park at the bottom of Easter Road and there was a, a railway bridge. And when the buses went past us, we just dropped bricks through the, sky, <laughs> through the skylights, which that's how I basically started. And then it was 84 when we actually got a mob together. That's when I became a boy, as they say. Whenever opposition firms travel to a game at Hibbs' ground, their firm will be waiting, hoping to dish out a bit of capital punishment. This is a street that all the way fans have got to come down to get to the stadium. And this street here has seen many, many, many battles in this street. This is one of our favourite places for attacking in the away firms. I like this street. Many memories in this street. We would be basically holed up in that pub there, and if anybody ever came, this would be a perfect place for us to attack them from. And it'd be funny because when people used to come east of the road, they'd say one minute there was none of them, and then the next minute there was hundreds of them, they were like rats coming at the sewer. We'd hide up here in the bushes and that, and when the mob's coming along, we could come running down for there. Behind and it's quite a good spot. All that's important is getting your fight. Then after it, you'll sit and go, oh no, I shouldn't have done that. The adrenaline takes over and it's just like a red mist. You just see that mob and that's where you're heading. But now, for me now, I've stopped while I got retired. There's the chairman. <laughs> you get my bands. I was invited to meet a man who was not only one of the youngest members of the Hibs crew, but also one of Scotland's top young boxers. The Holyrood gym is run by Bradley Welsh. Back in the mid 80s, he was running the young Hibs firm, known as the Baby Crew. Be like a Russian peasant in a French patisserie. I don't know what to expect from this guy, honestly. He's obviously got something about him, though, hasn't he? Sounds like the sort of person you'd want beside you if it all got a bit on top. So he goes around twice. He goes around twice, that is. That's a naughty dick. I must have been this size. Yeah, yeah I was a skinny little kid. Yeah. But I was a very good boxer, mate. At 14, I had won Scottish titles, Eastern Districts, boxed for Scotland and Internationals. Yeah. I was a very good boxer. The violence wasn't appealing to me. I was good at it. He was running the young Hibs firm at the tender age of 14. Most firms had a younger section, and Hibs' baby crew were the most notorious. I was um, one of the founding members of what you'd be known as the Hibs baby crew. Because we were the age of 13, 14, 15, we were obviously younger than the older Hibs one, which was the Capital City Service. So because it's been younger, it was like our older brothers and stuff. We didn't want to mess about with them or... Yeah, so we formed our own mob. I mean, the oldest member was, what, 15? 15. Yeah. 15 all school kids, basically. We were all school kids when we used to go. And this, really? so we, this started in about 83, 1983, on to 84, 85. And then by 16, 17, we sort of mobs amalgamated and came as one. But all, all just right game kids, you know what I mean? it was, because we were, we were full on it, 24-7, every day. Do you know what I mean? It was our thing. Notice that football, the Hibs, Blackley's baby crew, had me at one time with like 200 young kids. I was 14. And I'd been arrested up in Dundee, arrested at Ibrox. I'd been like seven arrests. I was only 14 for violence at football. It doesn't take a genius to imagine what the Hibs mob were like. Tough, angry boys like Bradley who wanted to be the best firm in Scotland. And in the mid 80s, when Hibs began to emerge as a fighting force, the mob that wore that crown were Aberdeen. And one of their members was this man. From 1984 to 1990, Dan Rivers travelled all over the country with the Aberdeen soccer casuals. Yeah. 
when I was young, I, I had no cares then, you know. I mean, I, I lived for the weekend, the, the cape or the crack. I mean, I was casual seven days a week. You know, we walked, talked casual, dressed casual. It, it was just a way of life. Looking back, you know, it was a dangerous game we were playing every weekend. Hospitalised, stabbed, beaten and almost kicked to death, Dan turned his back on casual life. But today he's back, reliving the journey into Edinburgh to face Hibs. They were the only people that really could come up against us to try and take the crown. Scotland's number one. It was our crown. But it's always a good battle. As the train rammed full of Aberdeen got closer, the Hibs firm who were waiting for them would make sure everyone was up for the battle. Basically, you only wanted the, the best to be there. Well, the ones you can trust. They didn't like the look of somebody, or if they knew somebody wasn't brave enough, you wouldn't come with us. You would be told you weren't coming with us, and you'd be sent. You'd be sent on your way. It was the same story back on the train. And I've seen what's happened to boys that ran away or backed away. It just wasn't worth your life doing it. You were there to do a job, and that's what we did. I don't know what it would be like sitting, waiting with a bunch of soldiers to go over the top, but you would imagine there would be nerves there. The casuals were almost like that wherever they went. They were waiting to go over the top. They knew there was a fight waiting for them when they got there, and yet, complete calm. Just a kind of, it was a sense of purpose, a frightening sense of purpose to know that you're going in to both practice violence and have violence practiced against you. But even the most hardened boys would have a last minute case of nerves. I mean, you'd get the butterflies and that would start, because you still didn't know what was waiting for you, what was happening, who was there, how many. There would be an element of fear, but that fear will drive you on. You've got to take that fear with you and use it to your, your advantage. Once the train had pulled into Edinburgh Station, the two mobs headed into battle. Went out of Waverley Station, got like 350, 400 boys with you. The bigger the mob, the better the buzz, you know. You're an army, ain't you? Just one unit. This is Aberdeen, this is your mob, this is it. Aberdeen would come up and uh, all you need to do is, as you see, just stand here and you can see if they're coming up and then one of our spotters could tell us exactly where they are, what way they were going, if they're going left or right. But this was a good place in the 80s for somebody to stand and watch them. On Easter Road, you sort of get a line come out. The boys are dancing about in the middle, the missiles have gone over. They're like, oh, top boys would go for it in the middle, their top boys would go for it in the middle. And then you just charge. As soon as the boys say, come on, Aberdeen, you just went for it. As soon as the fight started, we would just keep fighting, basically. That's... And then there was no jumping in and out. Once you were in, you were in. Until the police came and stopped it. Or if they never kept it, come and stopped it until we ever ran. And that's when it would stop. But there was none of that chasing each other or anything like that. Whereas it was once you were in, you were in. The firms may have been having fun, but in 1985, tragedy struck. A Hibs fan was almost killed during a battle with Aberdeen. It was a shame, it was, it was a shame because he basically got left, he was on one side of the road, we were on the other, and a lot of people did run that day, but uh, that was, that's the worst I've seen. He was badly injured, uh, really bad. Uh, some post papers actually reported that he died, but he didn't, uh, he just in a bad way. After the Remy Morel, when they nearly kicked him to death, Aberdeen for us, that word even just saying Aberdeen for us was, we had to get revenge, and we did get revenge. Hibbs's revenge came in the form of a weapon that was new to Scottish football violence. Aberdeen's mob were coming, coming this way, into the train station, and as they were sort of turning the corner, we, had, we were all mobbed up over there, coming for that end, and it was just as busy as well, basically what it is now. And uh, just at the, at the bus stop, the petrol bomb got thrown, it landed a bit here. See the flames up in the air and the bottle smashed in the middle of the road. You know, I think that just stunned everybody to turn in a corner, really, in football hooliganism. It was a buzz. It was a good buzz. But then we got the buzz more to see Aberdeen run. That was, that was our buzz. Just a pity that we couldn't catch any of them. That was a, definitely a turning point, that petrol bomb incident. That, that was them saying, you're not fucking coming down here and doing it again. 
But that was more as taking over the, the number one spot because Aberdeen were the best at that point. And then after that, we just continued. And every time we played Aberdeen, everybody would come out for Aberdeen. That was like our biggest, biggest game, biggest rivals was Aberdeen. Back in the gym, Bradley explained to me how the Morell incident was a turning point for the Hibs firm. From that day on, the Hibs mob just went for strength to strength. Organisation came in big time. We were the most organised mob. Mobs were travelling all in the country with two and three hundred. We would take 120 because it'd be 120 good boys. What we would do is we would travel to their place first before they could even got on a bus at 10 o'clock in the morning and come through. We would be 120 strong through sitting in a pub in Motherwell or in Dundee or Aberdeen. We used to go up to Aberdeen at like half six in the morning. I was going to ask you about, um, are Hibs, are they, are they famous for carrying weapons or...? Has there been instances that the Hibs mob have came up and yeah. have used weapons? Yes. They've used petrol bombs, they've used CS gas, they've used clubs, they've used knives. And that was primarily just against Aberdeen. Mate, it's hard to explain, but football violence back then was the part of camaraderie and you know, it was, that's why we were called the family, we were a, a strong unit. It was great, man. We were the kiddies. So before I left, there was just time for a quick training session, just in case anyone wanted to get a little bit leery with me on me travels. Fucking get up there. So far in Scotland, I'd seen the hatred in Glasgow between the old firm and discovered a more modern animosity with Aberdeen and Hibs. But what about the city whose two football clubs are closer together than any other two in Britain? I was going to Dundee, because what on earth happens when two rivals are literally on each other's doorsteps? So I found my way to Tannadice Street, yeah, which is home to Dundee United there, yeah? Now, you ain't gonna believe this. And there's Dundee. Now, that is, I've never seen anything like that before in my life. They're so close, it's ridiculous. I mean, I, I can't get me nut around it. I mean, it's, it's amazing. There are no clubs this close in the whole of the British Isles, yeah? And incredibly, these two clubs have got one firm. Unbelievable. Can't get me nut around it at all. I want to find out a bit more about it, so I'm going to go and meet a few of the boys. The Dundee Utility Crew are one of the most active firms in Scotland. So I just want you to explain to me how the Dundee Utility Crew come about. Because Dundee is such a small place, uh, I mean, it's what the fourth largest city in Scotland, but it's not very big really. Yeah. But they say that, uh, that the, all the main boys from United and Dundee, because we're all mates, would drink together on a Saturday night, would go away to whatever game, and then it just uh, went from there. So okay. one week it'd be away with Dundee, the next week away with United, away with Dundee, away with United. What about what about when you play each other? How does that work? There's no violence or hatred towards your mates, but you hate the team. And so you just uh, stay in your pubs, go to the game, and then hopefully your team wins. After a game, if United have been beaten, which has happened a couple of times, it's a nightmare. <laughs> so it's friendly banter. It never, it never ever comes to blows. It's just like... No. We're all friends. We're all friends. Everyone else is yeah, friends. Five members of the Dundee Utility were jailed for a total of eight years after they were involved in disturbances before the Scottish Cup final against Celtic in Glasgow. That organised hooligan group uh, engaged in a substantial serious disorder uh, away from the stadium, about a mile from the, the National Stadium at Hamden, and a significant number were arrested and substantial jail sentences were uh, handed out to these people. With the aid of CCTV, the police have managed to get the upper hand in the battle with football hooligans. They're totally on top of us. You cannot get a fight nowadays, no. you know what I mean? You'd have to be a way organised, a way up the top of some fucking hill, yeah. a way up the top of Scotland to get a fight. Increased intelligence means the police know all about what everyone's up to in Scotland, as I was about to find out for myself. That evening I was planning on meeting some of the other utility crew and go to a game with them. But the police had other plans for me. My stay in Dundee was about to come to a premature end.
In Dundee, I'd met up with a firm called the Dundee Utility Crew. And that evening, they were going to take me to meet around 80 of their lads and go to a game. But I was in for a shock. The police contacted the production team and requested I didn't go to the match, fearing that my presence would increase the risk of trouble. The old Bill know I'm here. And it's really rammed home to me the fact that they're so on top of it, it's unbelievable. It's like they know every movement of every firm, they know where they're going to be, where they're going. You know, and this is, we're talking about a small game here in Dundee, you know. I mean, I was just going to go watch the game, just get a feel for it, but, you know, I've been, I've been put a block on it by the old Bill. And um, the last thing I need is getting nicked. So, you know, we've, you know the production team have made a decision that um, uh, we're not going to go now. Someone the police knew a lot about back in the 80s was Aberdeen soccer casual Jay Allen. And in 1986, he got a shock. They didn't really think it was as serious as it was until, oh, until you realise, Jesus, you're inside, mate. Convicted for his part in a breach of the peace at Motherwell, it was his seventh conviction. And so he became one of the first hooligans in the country to be jailed. I mean, it was really embarrassing for my family and, uh, well, everyone involved in my family and my girlfriend's family. I mean, it was, that was the pit. And I wouldn't put myself through that again. I wouldn't put my family through that again. Today, he couldn't be further away from the life of a football hooligan. He runs a small hotel and pub in the tiny village of Meflik, just outside Aberdeen. You know, I had my time at it, and it was, it was really good fun, but uh, nothing lasts forever. Really enjoy being part of village life and various village things. I'm a community councillor as well. Running our toilets and helping with the old folks' party and doing my fishing and shooting. Wonderful girlfriend. Beautiful son. So, yeah, it's pretty sound. Jay's experiences mean that unlike some people I've met, he wouldn't want his son following in his casual footsteps. I couldn't be too hard on him, could I, really? But I would be a bit disappointed and I would be a bit scared for him. I wouldn't want him to lose his teeth or his freedom. But for John O'Kane, walking away from a life of football violence is not so simple. Despite having recently got out of prison for football violence, he knows that he can never say never. So you officially retired now, John? Yeah. Uh, didn't answer that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can say it yourself. Yeah, that's me. I'm not going. I'm not getting involved. But it's a drug. It's an alcoholic. You can't say uh, you're a non-drinker. Al alcoholics are never non-drinkers. They're always alcoholics, regardless of when the last drink was. Football hooligans, regardless of when the last time they were involved, will always be football hooligans. On my Scottish travels, I've learned that while some things evolve and change, other things will always be the same. Like any rivalry linked to a centuries-old religious divide, Celtic and Rangers is a hatred that will never die. But organised football violence between firms in Scotland on the huge scale that it once was is now a thing of the past. Increased punishments for offences has been enough to stop most of the trouble. But despite this, for a select few, the thrill and the adrenaline rush of football violence remains irresistible no matter what the consequences. Anyway, I'm going to slip through the long grass, get back down south. I'll see you later. <laughs>